Hi, I'm Femi OK. I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. Today, we take a look at Sierra Leone's declaration of a state of emergency over sexual violence. How did it go? We'll also pay tribute to a remarkable Somali journalist, Hodan Nalea. But first, we return to a guest who has joined us on the stream several times over the last two years, Uganda's musician turned politician Bobby Wine. Have a look at this clip of him talking to Al Jazeera's Catherine Soy back in May. We are lucky that we're living in a generation where our mouths cannot be shut. We shall speak the truth and we shall continue using the law as it is to stand for our rights. And has the president ever reached out to you? I mean, to talk about you know, political issues, to talk about how to move the country forward and things like that? No, he has not reached out to me. And, and would you be willing to sit down with him um, to talk about what's ailing the country and what perhaps can be done better because he is the head of state. I would be very glad and very honored to sit with the president. That interview was filmed just two days after Bobby Wine, an MP and opposition leader, was released from jail for protesting attacks on social media. Now, it hasn't been an easy road for Wine since he was elected to parliament in 2017. There have been treason charges. His driver was shot dead by security forces and he was badly injured while in military custody. So why does he keep going and what does he hope to achieve? Bobby Wine, Uganda Member of Parliament, joins us now from Kampala. Welcome back, Bobby, to the stream. It is good to have you. Some headlines that I know you're very familiar with, but just updating our audience. From Al Jazeera, singer Bobby Wine says he will run for Uganda president in 2021. Ugandan singer Bobby Wine plans to run for president in 2021. The last time we spoke, you didn't tell us about these plans. What made you decide that you could take on that top job in Uganda? Well, uh, we have been discussing it, and I remember the last time I hinted on it, but uh, we've come to a conclusion that we, as a generation, must challenge President Museveni. We're not going to wait for anybody else, but we ourselves. So right now, as we speak, we have resolved to challenge President Museveni, and my team believes that I can best represent our generation in this cause. I think our audience, or many of them as well, believe that as well. This is one person who writes in on Twitter, Bobby Wine can do great things to Uganda and for Uganda because he's one of the very few voices of the very many voiceless. He respects everyone and the country, needs a leader not in love with money, not greedy, not selfish, but in love with justice, not in love with publicity, but in love with humanity. So a supporter right there. But on the other hand, there are a few tweets like this. Busama says there is a big difference between leaders leading a country and being a voice for those that have been treated unjustly. So uh, seeing you as this voice for those who've been treated unjustly, some people are questioning whether that means that you can become president of the entire country. Are you ready for that? It looks like there I'm might sorry, be a I have a, a bad connection. It's can you okay. ask? We're, there's a slight delay there, but someone is questioning whether or not just because you're the voice of the voiceless, you can actually become a voice for the entire country. Well, uh, it has always been my humble desire to raise the voices of the common people. And here we are. We have an opportunity to put an end to a dictatorship country and uh, shattered the dreams of our people for a very long time. So, yes, now that this opportunity is here, we're going to seize it with both hands and legs. So, Bobby, you have to obviously campaign. Uh, there's no way that you can run for president without campaigning. We've actually talked to you before about how difficult it is to be an opposition politician. I'm looking here on your Twitter page here, and you talk about television and radio not being able to cover your events live. Can you tell us, is there an embargo on you appearing on TV, appearing on media? At one point, even your concerts were banned. What's the situation right now? Yes, uh, while President Museveni is currently going all over the country campaigning, he has blocked myself or any other opposition politician from reaching out to the audience. He's particularly scared of young people, and that's why he does not let me reach out to any people. Uh, the last time I tried to 
reach out to people in church. The church was tear gas. And yes, he has blocked all my music shows and any ability to communicate to the people. However, thanks to so social media and the energy within the people, we always find a way around that. And yes, even right now as we speak, I know that millions upon millions of young people are watching. So much as he tries to block us, we always find a way because mm. Uh, reality is on our side. I'm just looking here at this tweet here from Kakito James talking about the difficulty you have in terms of getting onto Uganda media. And he says, this just shows that indeed Museveni, or M7 as he's known, is feeling the people power heat. Malika. Mm. So I wanted to play one critical comment we got from someone who uh, takes issue with some of your travels. So here is a comment we got from Ian out of Kampala. Here's what he told us. I don't think he can perform. He's always out of the country on things non-official and non-beneficial to his constituents. In fact, I feel sorry for people that believe Boboen can make a president. I feel sorry for the people that he represents in parliament and I feel sorry for people who highly believe in him. I pity him. Bobby, what would you say back to Ian? Well, um, I do not blame some uh, well-fed young people that are benef beneficiaries of this regime. On the contrary, I represent more than 80 percent of the disenfranchised and excluded young people in Uganda. I must assert that whenever I leave the country, if I've not gone to perform uh, because I can't be allowed to do my job back home, I'm moving out to receive an award on humanitarian efforts, or I'm moving out to meet um, uh, partners in development. I wouldn't exp explain myself to the regime every time I move out of the country, but yes, I'm an international personality, and I represent my people not only within the country, but internationally. Let's talk about that international personality that you are well known for being. Buffalo Soldier, who's a supporter of yours, tweets this out. Nice seeing you all ready to hit the stage. And then here is a music poster, Bobby Wine Live. This is not an old poster from before you were an MP. This is, this is current. This was last month, the 7th of June, 2019, yeah. in Copenhagen. Yeah going here. Your Twitter page, Denmark, see you tonight. That was a couple of weeks ago. Look ready for action. And then underneath that, criticism about you not being a proper MP. You're an absentee MP. When you are campaigning to be president, are you still going to play gigs outside of Uganda? So you're going to be the musician and the politician and perhaps even president too. Can you do all of those things? Yeah, I'm a different kind of leader, and yes, I'm going to be a different kind of president. I'm going to be an ordinary human being that goes around my work the same way other human other citizens do, and that will allow me to understand the difficulties that common people go through doing their work. Um, I use music as a communication tool because I cannot perform home. Uh, my music was abolished, and indeed, all my concerts outlawed. I can only um, perform outside the country. And because music is my only form of, uh, um, of gainful employment, I have to go around uh, entertaining uh, my audiences. But most importantly, mm -hmm. the only opportunity that I get to freely air out um, the concerns of my people and uh, the, the only uh, time I get to communicate the plight of my people and highlight their um, Light is when I'm out of the country. Okay. So I use that at any opportunity I get. Bobby Wine, thank you for joining us on the stream. I'm sure that you will be back. Thank you very much for your contribution. And we will be following your campaign with great interest. Also, President Museveni, you are welcome to be on the stream anytime. We look forward to taking your, your tweet, your call on the stream. Now, we move to Sierra Leone. Have a look at this. and sexual assaults are being reported in this country. These despicable crimes of sexual violence are being committed against our own women, children, and even babies.
some of the fatalities are as young as three months old. 70% of the survivors of this traumatic experience are under the age 15. That was Sierra Leone's President Julius Madabio declaring sexual violence a national emergency back in February. As part of the plan, a dedicated police division was announced along with a special court focusing on rape and sexual assault. But the emergency status has just been revoked by Parliament and a new sexual crimes bill is in the works. So what was achieved from February to now? And can other countries learn from Sierra Leone's radical action? Well, joining us to discuss in Freetown, Sierra Leone, Fatmata Sorim, president of Lawyers, a group that gives pro bono legal services to vulnerable women and girls. And Vicky Rameau is in Accra, Ghana. She's from Sierra Leone and hosts the popular Vicky Rameau show. Welcome back to both of you. I want to start with this tweet from Deb Witso, who says, I think that gender-based violence and sexual assault can only be evaded if the Sierra Leone government chooses to enforce heavy punishments i.e. jail time, and implement them on offenders. At least this will cause fear and reduce the number of cases. So, Vicky, the state of emergency has been revoked. Does that mean that what this person in this tweet here has wished for came true? Um, no, actually, no. Uh, the state of emergency was revoked because parliament got back to the business of doing parliament. I mean, the fact is the emergency was there to set the ball in motion to get things in place for more action. Um, and so parliamentarians came together, they removed the state of emergency, and then they got down to the business of evaluating the Sexual Offenses Act with um, input from activists like lawyers and other women and women with civil society groups. Um, but the most important thing I think people need to understand is you can't fix a problem in six months, at least not a problem as pervasive as rape and rape culture in Sierra Leone. Um, Sierra Leone had a civil war. And I think that one of the things that we forget is that one of the big uh, leftovers or unsolved or unfixed or healed um, problems in our society is that we have so many women who were violated, so many girls who were violated during the war. And that means we had so many perpetrators of sexual violence in Sierra Leone. And nothing happened to these people, right? So what I believe has happened, because a lot of people ask, how did we get here? They're surprised mm. because these numbers are what they are. But what we have is a society where sexual violence and gender-based violence in general for so many years has gone untreated and people and women have been living in silence and in fear. And what's happened now because of the Rainbow Center and more um, access to reporting and access to facilities, that's why we're hearing these numbers. It's not that the problem okay. hasn't always been there. So let's talk about so, what, Vicky, let's, let's, I want to share the conversation with Fatmata as well. Uh, let's talk about what actually was achieved even in that very short time of the state of emergency. Fat matter. What would you point to to say, well, this is tangible. This would never have happened without this declaration. Go ahead. So what the first thing is that there's exhibition of political will, and we needed that to move things forward so that the people in power can understand that we continue to suffer irrespective of the laws we have. So we want proper um, implementation, execution, and we also want stiffer sentencing. Um, we've got a special court now that has been established by the judiciary since April. Um, it deals with uh, sexual offenses exclusively, and specific judges have been assigned to that. We've gotten speedy trials over the past couple of months, so there have been more cases that have gone through the criminal justice system. We're talking about over 200 as compared to the 30-something cases in 2018. We've got more people coming forward to complaints and report on these cases, so that's why we have a, a report that has come out to say that from January to now, we have about 1,681 cases that have been reported. So that is good enough to push us to the next level, which is the bill. Mm -hmm. We have the bill, and we have a stiffer sentence in the bill. We've been negotiating and lobbying and advocating with, with our parliamentarians to make sure that the stiffer sentencing, um, though we want it applicable, that there is some discretion given to the judges to set a minimum. So we want the law to also have a minimum as much as it has a, the maximum. We have a maximum of life imprisonment now. Um, if that bill passes into law, come the next session in September. So they, we, we definitely will get something on the ball rolling. But it's not going to be something that will be so resolved in a, in a few months, like Vicky said. We need more things like um, a forensic lab. We need more research. 
because we have we're talking we're talking about the war but we still don't understand what is pushing people to commit these atrocities on women mm -hmm. so we need research to really understand right. and I unpack their minds Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, that's why I think that the conversation really needs to go back into our homes and into our communities. We can't throw up our hands and say, oh, the, you know, the government has a state of emergency. Oh, there's a bill in parliament. So that's going to fix the problem. That is punitive, right? What we need is prevention. We don't want any girls or any women in Sierra Leone to be raped or sexually violated. That means that we need to change um, the relationships between men and women. We need to change the way women are perceived and the way women are treated and the rights of women, period. And men need to take responsibility for their actions in the sense that you don't have a right to a girl. You don't have a right to a woman's body, right? That no so means to, to no interject that right you, there, Vicky. So to but Tamata and, and Vicky, so I'm, I'm so glad that you said that because I wanted to bring this in. This is someone who agrees completely with you. Uh, TJ <laughs> says there should be a massive campaign by media houses and also among the various schools in Sierra Leone by educating young people about sexual consent and sex positive conversations that emphasize healthy and safe sexuality. So that education at the root of it uh, being the comment from online. But I wanted to also bring in a video comment from someone who talks about this being the beginning of the change. Have a listen. And we're beginning to see what the declaration means because once the government, particularly the president and the first lady's campaign, which has spelt out hands of our girls, is actually making a huge difference in communities, particularly with women and girls, gaining confidence. And we're seeing more reporting now done on various platforms, not just the face to face where women are going into the Family Support Center or the Rainbow Center, but they're also reaching out to campaigners and activists across the country, across the world even, when they want to report case. So Fatmata, where to next? So the word to next is passing the bill. That's the first one, making it into law, and then advocating and educating the populace to understand exactly that we have steeper sentencing now and you have to be careful. But we have so many more laws that we need to address. We have an issue wherein, even though a child needs to be protected under a law, we have a law that permits um, a parent to give consent for an yeah. underage child to be I mean, married to an yeah. adult man. So we're concerned about that. So we want absolute prohibition of early child marriage. Sure. So to give the, ki the right. children an opportunity to reach the fullest potential within their communities. Fat Mata so and, and Vicky, there's, there's so much more to mm -hmm. talk about. The list is endless. How do you even change that culture of sexual violence in just a few months? It's impossible. But it sounds like there is at least some progress being made. We will check back in on you. This story is not going anywhere. I would also love you to have a look at this on my laptop. There is a podcast called The Take. The Take is hosted by our very own Malika Bilal. Current episode is about Sierra Leone and sexual violence there. You can find this podcast anywhere where you check up and subscribe to your podcast online at Jetty. So look for Jetty and The Take. From Sierra Leone, we move to Somalia, where last week a much-loved and respected journalist, Holden Naleya, was killed in an attack by Al-Shabaab armed group. Her cousin, Suad, sent us this video. Bismillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I am Suad Gallo. Thank you, Al Jazeera International USA. Hodan Naleya was a mother and wife. She was a light of hope. She was a change maker and positive thinker. She was a full of love and full of kindness. She was caring and forgiveness person. That's who she was, Hodon Naleye. May Allah grant her the highest level of Jannah. Allahu Yameen, Allahu Yameen. Thank you again. Al Jazeera International USA to give me the opportunity to share with you who she was and how we would like to remember her forever. Our thanks to Suad for that. Now, last week after Hodan was tragically killed, several people tweeted at us that we should pay tribute to her and her work on the stream. Here's just one of those tweets. Molib said, can we have a special show in memory of Hodan and all brave journalists who sacrificed their lives to rebuild Somalia? Let's talk about our resolve to keep the legacy of all those who paid the ultimate price in telling our story. So with us today to remember Hodan is Abdi Latif Dahir. He's a journalist with Quartz Africa based in Nairobi who was a friend of Hodan's. Welcome, Abdi. Talk to us about the first time that you met Hodan Naleya. 
Thank you, Malika. Um, I met Hadan for the first time in 2014 at a creative storytelling uh, workshop in the UK. And uh, one of the things that I really remember that struck me immediately was her, sense, her incredible sense of generosity, uh, her vibrancy, her energy, um, the way she was very invested in not just storytelling, but also telling stories about Somalia and, and, you know, in a country that is known for conflagration and war and disasters, she really emphasized the idea of integration, right, which was also the basis of her, her YouTube channel, Integration TV. She spoke about collaboration. She spoke about um, contemplation. And I think she was really dedicated to the idea of, of, of using stories to shape uh, the narrative of Somalia right. to tell not, not just positive stories but more nuanced sure. uh, stories. Abdi, I'm looking at Integration TV, which has got thousands of subscribers. This is Hodan here. There were so many stories that we were thinking, which one should we show? Which one show the joy, the pleasure she takes about talking about her homeland? And we decided upon tea. Have a look. <laughs> I got my money, and one of the things I've learned is that in Somali cities, they don't really serve you if you're a woman the best tea. So I've heard the best tea is a place called Mubarak Cafe here. So I'm going to check it out, see if they're going to allow me to have Kopshan Abu Kirige. Hey, Salam Alaikum. Oh, Khattara is the Anabora. Not Anagil, Anabora. She almost makes you feel that you can taste it. Why did you love that story so much, Abdi? I think it says a lot about who Hadan was, uh, both as a person and also as a journalist who's an incredible storyteller. Um, it, that scene in itself, it's like it, she, here she is, you know, in a different city, walking into like a public space uh, where she's occupying and telling us, you know, the, the, the narrative of what makes Somali Somali unique, right? Like, and and it's just, uh, I think the nuances like that come out in her stories. That's what um, that won the hearts of so many people, not just on YouTube and, and in Somali uh, communities, but at home in the diaspora, but people all across the world. She was able to thread together these stories of, of um, you know, trying to tell people there's another side to this country. There's another side to this uh, uh, country that uh, you know is just not disaster and famine and, and war. Mm. Uh, this on Twitter, Abdinur says, Hodan was an eye-opener for the power of women. When they use their creative roles to tell positive stories of their homeland, the best way to repay her is for YouTube and social media giants to support women creators, especially from Somalia. So, Abdi, in thinking about her legacy, what's the best way for it to be carried on? Yes, I mean, Hodan touched the, the lives of so many people across the world, and... and uh, one one thing for me is that in a she really deepened the meaning of what peace journalism stands for. She really was an, uh, somebody who was able to tell uh, stories about her, about Somalia and about Somalis both at home and in the diaspora. And in thinking about her legacy, and I think uh, it gives us the responsibility, right? Like she has passed on this responsibility now to us, both as Somalis and also as a journalist, writers, and thinkers to be able to um, uh, contribute and, and to be able to tell stories that, you know, move the trajectory of this country, Abdi. not just out of uh, war, but, uh, uh, you know, into a narrative that tells uh, something more relatable and more connected to people. All over Thank you so much for helping us remember Hodan so beautifully. You can find her still on Twitter at Hoden TV and see the beauty of Somalia that she represents there. We will leave you today with a clip of Hoden doing what she loved, enjoying the beauty of Somalia. Thanks for watching. We're going to climb the top of the Simi with the historic Burta Seitka. This is amazing. This is a historic little mountain where the Darwish they climbed and saved us from the British. So let's go. <laughs> All right, we're almost there. We're on the top of the hill. We got it. Yeah. Can we go back? No. I'm not going back. I'm going to climb this mountain and conquer it. MashaAllah, and then keep us to Allah. I made it to the top of the hill. It's almost Maghrib here in Las Anod. But look at this beautiful land. Every time I'm in every Somali city, I say Alhamdulillah. I say MashaAllah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us this beautiful land that we can enjoy and nature.
top of Los Anos.